Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. Yeah. Sorry? Thank you. Thank you. A few years ago, my grandmother died. Yeah, that's okay. It's not really a downer presentation. It's just the start. And uh, recently, I was going through her stuff, as one does when someone dies, and I found this telegram from 1954. Here's what it looks like. I have to stand back here or go over to the thing. There's what it looks like there. And if you can't read it, it was sent from her uncle to her father in 1954. And it says, Dad died yesterday, burial Tuesday, 2 o'clock, Aurora. Jack Davis. Huh? It is Twitter size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm making an email metaphor here, but it is also a Twitter metaphor. So. I love the economy of language there, right? Uh, you paid by the word with telegrams. And so uh, the condolences and stuff, or you know, sorry even, could wait until next Tuesday, right, at the funeral. So you pay about $2, or that at the time cost about $2.50 in uh, 1954. So in Canadian dollars now, $2.50 equals, uh, well, first off, Canadian, 250 Canadian equaled 250 US in 1954 uh, because before 1960, our currency was stronger than yours. And, and yeah, thank you, my brothers and sisters in Canada. Yes, and we're coming for you. I don't know if you've seen the exchange rate lately, but it's up there and we're coming for you. Yeah, so anyway, uh, in 1954, 250. Today, that telegram costs $19.84. So that's about $2 a word. Um, so imagine for a minute, if you paid $2 for every word in every email you ever wrote, what would spam look like? Something like that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So I, I, met a, I took a cab over here, and my cab driver was Nigerian, which I thought was funny. Um, also, anyway, so 1984 also equals some other stuff and other currencies, right? It's 1864 American. It's a little over 2,000 Japanese yen, and it's five lira and 84 cents in Malta, where I live. You know what that sound is? That's half the room looking up where Malta is. It's here, in case you're wondering, just south of Sicily. Sweet healthcare. So, interestingly enough, uh, Canadian, 1984 Canadian also works out to about 5,000 Linden dollars and about 250 World of Warcraft gold. That'll buy us some really nice level 70 crimson elbow pads of death or something, right? Like whatever those are. Um, but that's a black market rate because you can't really convert that currency, so don't rely upon it. So my great-great-grandfather dies. Um, my great-great-uncle sends a, a telegram to my great-grandfather informing him. My grandmother keeps the telegram. She dies, and I get it. It's enough to make you think about your own mortality, isn't it? So that's what I've been doing lately. I've been thinking about my own mortality, about life and death and, and how I might be remembered. Like, for example, if I died on stage right now, if I just flopped over of some you know, awful disease or a heart attack, what would my legacy be? It might be that. <laughs> yes, sweet. Yeah, that's, that's disappointing. Um, so, so I've been thinking about how to uh, revise my legacy, uh, thinking about big things, about, about kind of how to do good, right? To, to revise what gets written on my tombstone. And uh, I, I do, do some good already, like um, I have done little projects online which have raised some money here and there, and my wife and I do donate to charities that we support uh, periodically on an ongoing basis, but I haven't done it very systematically, and uh, I'm, I'm certain that I haven't done enough. In Vancouver, where I used to live before I moved to Malta, um, there's a hot dog stand at the corner of Granville and Georgia. This is it here. Uh, if you are in Vancouver, try the turkey smoky. It kicks ass. Get the fried onions. Um, beside this hot dog stand, there's a young woman who often is sitting there. And she's uh, had a hard time, clearly, and she's probably homeless. And um, sometimes I buy her a hot dog. N not because I'm smart or, or you know, thought of that a great idea. I saw somebody else do it, 
and it seemed like a good thing to do, and it only cost 250. And her name, by the way, is Stacy, right? And so every once in a while, I, uh, I say to the guy, here's an extra 250, buy Stacy a hot dog when she wants one. Um, so thinking about charity and doing good, this seemed to me to be the sort of minimum act of charity, a kind of one meal for one person, right? A couple bucks. So if I want to do good and I want to think about doing more good, particularly in terms of technology and the web, I need to be systematic about it, right? I need to work out uh, a way to kind of measure and quantify my good deeds if I'm going to make some or make something that does good deeds. So by the way, uh, if you're an economist or a sociologist or any kind of social scientist in the room, you need to leave now because the science and the math after this point is totally half-assed. And if you hang around, you're just going to look like this. <laughs> so, or you're going to come beat me up afterwards. And I'll bet I can take you because you're an economist, but I don't want that. <laughs> so we need a basic currency. I need a currency to evaluate good, how to do good. Um, and so I thought, well, one meal for one person, that's a great currency. That's what it's going to be. And I'm going to call it the Stacy in, in, in honor of a the young woman sitting beside the hot dog stand. One meal for one person earns me a Stacy. So if you keep a person alive for a year, that's about 1,100 Stacys. So of course, there are a lot of ways to do good, probably six billion of them. But I want to focus, because we're at a tech conference and I'm kind of a geek, on IT and technology projects that, and uh, sort of that category of stuff. A couple of disclaimers. First off, obviously, um, you know, you could invent something really big, that the infrastructure of the web that changes the world, right, and uh, does immeasurable good for lots of people, like the Googles and the Flickers and the, and the whatever, you pick your company, uh, not MySpace, of course, but the other ones do immeasurable good, and uh, some bad, but mostly good. And uh, so you could, I could do that, but I'm not smart enough, and I'm not lucky enough, and I don't know enough, and I don't know enough people. So we're not even going to talk about those, because also, they're also very, very hard to measure. Um, there's also a kind of reductio ad nauseum about that logic, because you know, if I'd invented the wheel, that would have helped a lot of people, but we're a little past that. So, additionally, I am not a hippie. I have never been to Burning Man. I do not nor own nor have never touched a bongo drum, and I only own one pair of sandals, and they're very sporty. <laughs> so I just want you to know that I'm not some guy who's come from like, you know, if I say Hornby Island, the BC people will know this, but some small, you know, commune in BC to, you know, lecture you about doing good. I'm a geek uh, and uh, not a very good one, but a geek nonetheless. Um, so, in thinking about these things, I'm hoping to get a better sense of myself, how I can do my time, and maybe help some of the people in this room think about it and do more. So from here on in, I'm going to kind of profile a series of interesting technology projects on what I perceive as to be a sliding, well, more or less a sliding scale of good. This is Nabur. If you are too lazy or too busy or not smart enough to leave your living room, this is the sort of simplest way you can help. Uh, they're a really interesting um, collaboration project, and their um, spiel is that they connect so-called uh, high-performing volunteers, uh, professionals of various kinds, in the developed world with projects that need their help in the developing world, right? Um, so a group of people want to start a beekeeping project in Sierra Leone, but they need a marketing plan. So they get a marketer in North America to write their marketing plan for them, to do a small task from your own living room, okay? It's an interesting and powerful idea, I think. It's a kind of crowdsourcing to people who you don't, uh, people who you don't have access to in your local community if you're in Southeast Asia or Africa or, or uh, you know, wherever the developing world you may be. So Nabur has about um, 200 projects ongoing with about 8,000 high capacity volunteers, right? Um, they might be also like coordinating the shipping of computers from Canada to a school in Honduras or something, which needs them. So uh, in this case, if I worked on Nebur, not that I built, not if I built Nebur, we'll get to that later, but if I just did a task on Nebur, right? Let's say I wrote a, a business plan. There's an example here, um, some uh, Maasai, um, folks in Kenya, or is it Kenya, I never know, um, want to start an ecotourism business, right? And there are 30 families, and so that's about 130 people. And so they need a bunch of stuff done to help research and create this uh, 
ecotourism business. And one of those activities is writing a marketing plan. So I could write a marketing plan because I'm in marketing, right? So I'll write a marketing plan for them. And I would be helping these 130 people. Now, there are also 22 other volunteers doing various tasks on this project. And of course, the Kenyans uh, are doing most of the work because we're just helping them with the high level stuff and they're, they're doing you know, the majority of the work. So maybe we're the volunteers in the developed world are doing 20% of the work. And then I need to divide that 20% by the 22 other volunteers plus myself. So when I kind of work all that out and I do some math, uh, I figure that uh, participating in the bird to write a marketing plan earns me about 1,200 stasis, right? Or enough to keep one person alive for about a year. So we're gonna come back to this chart a lot, so get familiar with it. So a step up from there, how many people, oh, sorry, I wanted to mention, if you uh, don't wanna leave your living room but you wanna work closer to home, this is an interesting project that uh, enables professionals to mentor kids uh, who are leaving high school into the workforce or into college. It's called icouldbe.org. So, Geek Core. Has there, how many people have heard of Geek Core? It's been high profile. Yeah, yeah, lots of people have. So Geek Core is the next step, right? So I want to leave my living room. I want to volunteer in Africa for a year. I join Geek Core if I have some elite geek skills, which I do not, but let's pretend I do. Um, and I want to go to Africa for a year to help with IT training or to build out computer infrastructure. You come to Geek Core and you apply and they send you abroad. Um, one of their most fascinating projects is, um, oops, sorry, training, training, Moulin, uh, Moulin Wiki. This is a offline copy of Wikipedia. Uh, and so what they do is they, and it, they take out the photos, or they, you know, they remove the photos, and then they um, lay the entire contents of Wikipedia on one CD and distribute it to, in this case, Mali and Western Africa, where people do not have an internet connection, but they have a computer. So they build the software to run the thing and um, send this around. And so far they've sent 600 CDs around to Mali and West Africa. And um, they also do fascinating work translating Wikipedia into local languages, which, you know, I know you go to Wikipedia and you're like, oh my God, it's in, you know, Farsi and it's in Swedish and it's in whatever. But it's also not in a bunch of local languages, which maybe two or three million people speak in Africa or, or other parts of the world. So, so that's some other work they do. So this is the next step. I, I can get on my house. I want to uh, maybe travel a little bit. I want to do some good works abroad. I go to Geek Core. And this is difficult to calculate because the work you'd be doing you know, would probably be creating jobs for people, essentially. You'd be training people or em employing, deploying infrastructure, which would, in effect, um, create jobs. But then, of course, they're doing most of the work because they're working. You're just helping create the opportunity. So I figure Geek Core. Yeah, I get it. Uh, doing some math, I figure it gets me about 9,500 stasis. You know. So, before we move on to more sophisticated and complicated things, there's a bit of uh, economic theory which I need to cover. Uh, economists, being clinical folks, say do not volunteer. Whatever you do, don't volunteer. If you're a professional of any kind, just work more, work overtime, spend less, and give the difference to charity. And they have a really, you know, uh, really sound point there. What if I worked in a soup kitchen, okay? If I just volunteered two hours of my time in a soup kitchen, I could probably make soup for 50 people, okay? But instead, if I just did an extra two hours of consulting or whatever, and I earned a couple hundred bucks, well, and I gave that to the soup kitchen, the soup kitchen can hire, you know, five cooks for two hours, and they make much better soup and, and feed a lot more people. So this is an interesting point to consider, certainly. And, but the reality is, People are chintzy. In most of the world, there are far more, if you look at percentages of the population, there are far more people volunteering than giving. In Denmark, for example, which has the highest amount of volunteers in the world, 5% uh, of their population volunteers, but only 0.5 makes donations. America and the US are the exceptions to this rule. We are excellent givers, but we're lousy volunteers. Um, we can discuss why you think that is. So, um, let's, Let's think maybe, maybe I work 15 or 16 extra hours a month and I earn 1,600 bucks, okay? I take that 1,600 bucks, I give it to the soup kitchen. Soup kitchen in North America costs about, per meal, it costs about a buck 20 to feed people, okay? So that earns me, if you amortize it, work it out over a year, 16,000 stasis. But then if I take it to Africa and give it to people there, it earns, uh, I can feed four Africans for the price of one American. 
which is controversial. Not as apparently as controversial as the last talk, but nonetheless, um, that's an interesting problem to think about too. So there you go, 16,000 for the US, 66,000 in Africa. This is a very bad joke about John Denver, that's a country road. I was gonna show you Mount Mama, but no. anyway. Um, <laughs> Next project was started by John Denver in 1992. It's called Plant It 2020. And um, I'm gonna roll back a second and say, it's hard to build things in real life. If we wanted to build this building anywhere in the world, you know, in Indonesia or in Thailand or in wherever, it takes a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of skill, a lot of time. Building things in the virtual world though, those are easier and quicker. So, um, Plant It 2020 has a kind of boring mandate, but an important one. They uh, try to plant, protect and maintain rare tree species around the world, right? Very important work, not super sexy, um, but one way in which they tried to sex it up was to launch something called second, <laughs> it's funny because it says golden shower, but anyway, um, <laughs> uh, speaking of sex, um, they launched something called second chance trees, which was a, a, an island in second life, which uh, enabled people, second life users, to buy a virtual tree in second life and plant, uh, then the, the organization would plant a real tree in real life. Buy a virtual tree, get a real tree. Uh, the cost of these trees was 300 linden dollars, which worked out to about a buck 12 American. Um, and um, so uh, they launched this project and, and they have thus far sold about 500 trees. So it's 500 virtual trees, 500 real trees. I have a pr made a problem for myself now because I calculated stasis to be about human beings and one meal for one person. But it's my currency and time is short, so I'm gonna say one tree saved also equals one stasis. So that gets you 500 stasis for, sec uh, for second chance uh, trees. Sticking with Second Life, what's this? Thank you. And this is a virtual yak. Save the Children is a big UK charity. They are concerned with providing health welfare, safety and security for the world's poorest children. And uh, they had an interesting idea to launch a project in Second Life, I think it was called the Yak Shack or the Yak Ranch, I can't remember. You could buy a virtual yak in Second Life. And once you bought it, you could milk it and it produced virtual milk. <laughs> that's a furry milking that, that's a man-sized cat milking that yak. <laughs> Someone told me, and maybe Beth can verify, that the furries are the largest group of people in Second Life. Maybe that's changed, maybe that's just, it just sounds good, so I like saying it. Um, you can, so you can milk your yak, you can ride your yak, and you can mod your yak. This is kind of a chia yak, with a thing going on there. I, but you can you shave it, yes, that's, a, yeah, exactly. Good one. Um, I wish I'd thought of that joke earlier, because it would've gone, yeah. Um, so the yaks are more expensive, they cost a thousand linen dollars, which is about 375 in good old American dollars. And those folks sold over 200 yaks, which gets you about 800 American dollars. And you know, if you're, if you're listening, you're thinking, this is underwhelming. 500 bucks, 800 bucks? I could get four of my friends together, we could produce 800 bucks and give it a charity pretty fast, right? And I agree, the message here, and, and if somebody knows of great, highly lucrative Second Life projects, I wanna hear about them. Um, yeah, let's hear it. $115,000, real life dollars. And how, what was it? Maybe you wanna get a microphone and tell us about it. Can, yeah, sure. Do we have the microphone down here for a second? Or do you wanna tell us about it? Yeah, all right, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the cause? It was $115,000 uh, this year for uh, the Relay for Life. For the American Relay Cancer for Life, Society. For, yeah. for cancer? American Cancer Society, Excellent. yes. And what, did they, what was their spiel? What was their, their, their thing in Second Life? It's the, they've been doing it for the last couple of years. It's basically the same as the real life events where you walk around. Last year they did a whole like virtual cities. You walk through London, you walk oh, cool. through different places. You walk these pedometers or ca counting your uh, ticks and people mm. bid uh, based on how long people were gonna walk in the virtual space. Like and so how did they raise so much money? Because you know, that's like- Lots of bids. Because I only see you know, 50,000 users in Second Life at any time, so that's three bucks a, every, for every user in the game at one time, isn't it? Oh, I see, so it's not like a live, yeah, I see. Okay, well, I'd be curious to talk to you more about that after. So, but my point was gonna be, not a lot of money, with this glowing exception, uh, but great PR. Both these campaigns got a ton of real life uh, uh, media attention, and you know, public relations professionals will give you numbers on how much that's worth. I'm not one of those people, but um, nonetheless, 
that's highly valuable. Now, of course, that's not gonna happen every time you launch a project in Second Life, uh, because though there's been plenty of breathless writing about Second Life in the last year, I think we're getting through it. Yeah, amen for that. Uh, okay, and then back to my little chart here. Stacy's earned Second Life trees, Second Life yaks. Uh, I worked that out to be 500 and 2700. So, let's take a little change gears for a second. Yeah, you like, you like the look of them? Um, this, is the, um, this is the former and current king of Bhutan, tiny nation in Asia. And um, in 1972, the guy on the, my left uh, devised the notion of, uh, uh, what's it called? Gross national happiness. He devised the notion of gross national happiness. Uh, and which is the idea uh, from kind of Buddhist origins that you know the important thing to consider in a nation is not GDP or how much it produces, but how happy it is. And this is a powerful idea. Uh, so can we do good by making people happy? And how do we think about that? Right? Um, the difficulty, and, and you know, people take this idea very seriously. There are conferences. This one's in scenic Antigonish a couple of years ago. And if you're in Bangkok this fall, you can go to the conference there the third international conference on gross national happiness. Um, and there's a whole school of economic theory about this and, and, and ongoing conversations. Um, this, uh, for, at the University of Leicester in, in the UK, a uh, psychologist there devised this map, which was the satisfa satisfaction with life index. And she said that uh, the most satisfied, happiest country of the world, based in kind of weighted analysis of a bunch of factors, including health and wealth and um, access to education, is uh, green. Green is the happiest, yes, and then blue. And uh, Denmark, again, what's with, with the Denmark, um, is the happiest nation. And then the orange and then the red are the least happiest nation. So Burundi was the least happiest nation. Uh, again, my Canadian brothers and sisters, Canada, more happy than the US. <laughs> Secret meeting after. <laughs> then we begin the takeover. No. Um, so, and of course, as we know, happiness and laughter, you hear about this all the time. There's a crappy Robin Williams movie about it. Helps your health too, right? It uh, improves your circulation, it reduces stress, it uh, strengthens your heart, uh, so on and so forth. So, but really, uh, smarter, smarter people than me are working on how we measure happiness and how we evaluate it in a meaningful uh, way that we can report and share with each other, and they haven't quite worked it out yet. But anyway, I'm just gonna charge on through and see what we can figure out on our own. Because I have some data here, and I'm glad Chris mentioned it earlier, but uh, in January this year, I launched this silly little site called uh, Get a First Life, right? And the, thank you, thank you. And it's just this little gentle, gentle satire of Second Life. And uh, 600,000 people have seen it, right? Okay, so then I thought about, okay, 600,000 people saw it, they kind of liked it. How much did they like it? I asked around, and I thought, uh, and it seemed like they laughed an average of 15 seconds, right? This site is worth 15 seconds of laughter. 15 seconds times 600,000 people gets you 250, no, sorry, 2,500 hours of laughter. Great. As a kind of second data point from my personal experience, I wrote, I write plays occasionally. I wrote a play, it was in the fringe. There's a naked guy there, except there's a basketball. Uh, it was called Bullocks, right? It was in uh, a couple of fringe uh, festivals around Canada, and uh, 600 people came and saw it. Woo, 600, wow, yeah, this is theater after all. Um, but it's an hour long play, and people liked it, reviews are good, and I figure people laughed for like 15 minutes of the 60 minutes, certainly. They enjoyed it that much, and why not? Because it's got talking testicles, right? I don't know. You know, a number of Shakespeare plays had them, but they cut them. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> pretty York, why? That was our, anyway, so, um, but you work that out, and it's only 90 hours of laughter, right, all in. So either I need to get another 10,000 to match, get a first life, I need to get another 10,000 people to my plays or make them a lot funnier still. Um, but how much is that worth? How much is that worth, who knows? I don't know, certainly, uh, but I'm giving myself 500 Stacy's for that project, so mm, that doesn't really rank, considering I could earn 66,000 Stacy's just for donating some money. Um, but nonetheless, happiness, something to think about and certainly beyond the scope of uh, my time. So, now we get into the big projects. A couple really big, um, influential projects that have incredible scope and incredible influence. But they're, they're IT projects, and in theory, if I were smarter or luckier or had more help, these are things I might have made. And, and here's where I would have done a lot of good. So uh, Rick Riley is a award-winning sports illustrated, he's a sports writer, he writes for Sports Illustrated, and last year he wrote a column called Nothing But Nets. And he had recently learned about uh, malaria and how it ravages um, you know, uh, certain parts of the world, most notably sub-Saharan Africa. Um, if that's for me, you take a message. Uh, and 
the, um, he, he had recently learned about it. He learned that, for example, a child dies of malaria every 30 seconds in Africa, right? It's the leading cause of death in Su the Sudan for children under five. So he decided he needed to do something. So for the first time in 21 years of columns, he asked his readers something. He asked them if they would each send $10 to the UN Foundation, not part of the UN, but an associated agency, um, to buy, 10 bucks buys you, buys a net, the shipping, the instruction, the actual device for, Chris, can you come up here? Chris, are you in the room? You left. I need a volunteer. Leela Fever, thank you. Come on up. I'm going to embarrass you a little. Um, so, um, so for 10 bucks, you get, you get a mosquito net. And you send it to Africa. I'm just going to put this on you. I thought I'd make a nice photo. Yeah, they're good. So now he's protected for four years, up to 90% for, uh, well, we'd have to put it, hang it correctly and put it on the ground and so forth. But uh, yeah, thank you. You're very, you're very, you're very kind there, uh, Jesse. He's not going to shake my hand even. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Uh, so um, so 1.4 million he raised just by writing the column. And the UN Foundation said, oh, shit, we need to act on this. And so they launched nothingbutnets.net which is, um, I kind of like to call it, uh, these sites, pyramid schemes for good, right? Because what this does is, and they, they partnered with Sports Illustrated and the NBA, but the real partners are like the thousands of people they get to launch micro fundraising projects within their community. So you talk to your 10 friends and you raise $1,000 and buy, God, 10 nets, 100 nets for, um, uh, for uh, this project, right? They have, at this point, there, when I took the screenshot a few days ago, 826,000 nets, right? That's based on eight, over $8 million raised. So, to my notes here, find my, um, here we are, um, 800,000 nets. So, what does that work out to? I, I do the math, so they sent about, uh, so they sent 800,000 nets, I did the math, I worked out that they probably saved at least 50,000 lives, right? Because um, malaria impacts most on children under five and on uh, pregnant women. So 50,000 50, people, what's a life worth in, worth in Stacey's? Well, I worked it out to maybe 50,000. So 50,000 lives saved times 50,000 Stacey's earns them 2.5 billion Stacey's. Look at that. It's kind of flattening out all the other numbers. All that stuff doesn't really matter. So the lesson here and the lesson of the next uh, project is if you want to have a major impact, build infrastructure, build pyramid schemes for good. This is Tom Williams. He had an auspicious beginning to his career because he was the youngest employee at Apple at the age of 15. Uh, he subsequently went on to manage a uh, venture capital fund, got very embittered and upset, and uh, left and wanted to find some meaning in his life, so he launched this project called Give Meaning. It is a project-based fundraising site in a very Web 2.0 way. It has the user generated content and the RSS and all the widgets and all that stuff. Um, but the idea here is you uh, launch a project on anything. Tom says most of the projects are about international development and thongs. I thought he said thongs, which was exciting, but it's thongs. Like walkathons or uh, marathons or bikeathons. <laughs> yeah, a site that raises money with thongs? Well, you know, anyway. No. So, um, uh, sexy or sexist? Yes, it, it might be. I'm sure there are sites that do that. If not, perhaps I should just invent that. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Um, um, so, um, so the idea here is that what's interesting about this, and it's an interesting kind of social media idea, is that before you can actually start a project and launch it on the site, you need to get a consensus of 100 people you know to vote for it. It's kind of like Dig. You've got to get to the front page of Dig um, of Give Meaning, right? before you can actually start raising money. So what that does is build a consensus around the project and makes it much easier for the fundraiser, the person taking on the project, and this, could, this can be for anything. It can be for like my friend who has cancer and he needs alternative medicine so uh, his insurance doesn't cover it, so let's raise some money. Or, you know, this is a, a project that my friend Tarina, uh, ter uh, she's a twin, Tarina or Michelle? I think it's Michelle. Uh, Michelle uh, launched to, she did some work in Africa and uh, she wanted to get a well dug for a, particular fan, for a particular village that she was in in Liberia. And this is kind of a common model. People go to 
to, to places, impoverished places around the world, come back, want to do something small for people they know there, right? This kind of social real world connection. And so they do this. And so they, they were successful and they, they, they um, raised a thousand bucks and uh, dug the well. How am I doing for time? Oh, Jesus, no pressure. Okay, I'm not even gonna take that. But um, If you wanna talk to me later, in the States, do you have UNICEF boxes at Halloween? Do you know what? Yeah. Not anymore, or do you still have them? Yeah, so in Canada, I grew up with these. These were like fundamentally part of our childhood experience in, on Halloween. And uh, they, recently, uh, they recently canceled them for what sounded to me to be highly dubious reasons. Um, I'm gonna, not going to talk about it now because it would take a little too much time, but if you're interested, talk to me afterwards because uh, what Give Meaning has done is built the UNICEF Box 2.0, and it, it kicks ass on the first one, and it's just a really smart way of engaging with communities um, in a meaningful way. So, the end of my notes. So there you are. The conclusion, obviously, is build infrastructure. Build something that helps other people do good, right? Don't build something for yourself, um, or don't be selfish and uh, just <laughs> don't be selfish and volunteer. Uh, try to build something great, okay? So now, of course, is the time in your typical Gnome Dex talk where I announce my project, my killer thing. You know, it's like the, the app that's got the AJAX powered and the mobile aware, and it's got the RSS bits and the widgets and the blog and the user generated content and all that. So here it is. I don't have one. Uh, I don't have one at all. All I got is the stupid thought experiment and some of your time. And so when Chris invited me to talk, he asked me, and I think he probably asked lots of people this, well, what have you always wanted to bring to the conference um, that you haven't seen? And so I thought about it, and I thought I could talk about social media or marketing. But then I thought about you know this telegram and about my uh, dubious legacy and uh, Stacy and the hot dog stand, and I thought, then I thought, the people in this room are smart and influential and powerful. And lots of them have done good. And people in this room have built stuff that do help millions of people, as long as you're not from MySpace. And, um, and so, you know, it's important, I think, that you keep doing good. And for the rest of us, and myself included, who maybe haven't done those things, or are working on those things, but haven't figured out how to make them successful yet, like I met Tom Williams at Web of Change, for example, and I heard about Web, uh, Nabur through the Web of Change Network and that sort of thing. So, and, yep. On, on stats, I'm, I'm from Denmark, and, and there are a couple of, um, when you dig deeper, there's always some funny stories behind it. Um, number one, we have the highest um, account of suicides in Denmark. Uh -huh. So maybe we get rid of all the unhappy people <laughs> that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's sound thinking. You Danes are bright. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The second part is that we have, we have the lowest life expectancy of any Western European country. The lowest. The lowest. All right, um, so there's no old, miserable people either. No, exactly. Yeah. So I could, well, I could be another part. But it's also, but, but sorry, if you, look, if you look beyond those stats, I think that, um, for example, the water wheel that you showed, uh, there was another water purifying straw. There, there's a bunch of, hmm. it, it seems as if a lot of, in, in Denmark and in Scandinavia, we've often been well known for our designs. And, there was a, something called index awards, where um, where all of these, actually several of the things that you showed have, have all been featured. Mm -hmm. I think that that taking the it's it's the next it's the next natural step in in designing. It's not just for the eye, but it's also designing for the for the human. Mm. I think there's a lot to be learned just from from that. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think the, 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 the photos, like the, the real world technology is so powerful when you look at them and you think, oh, they're using kid power to pump water, like genius, right? No, we gotta go. We gotta go? Yeah, Sorry, we okay. gotta. Chris, you can negotiate. can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Do you, do you can ask you, Guy. Do you said. need a mosquito net for your talk? Or are you okay? No. Okay. Real, you wanna ask real quick while he's walking off stage? I think it's, it's often driven by personalities, much like IT projects I find, like, um, like people, there's one guy who has a dream and builds it and, and draws people to him, or one woman who builds it and she draws people to her uh, out of her kind of particular combination, charisma, so forth. Thank you, Darren. Thank you very much.